You're looking for me. I believe whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. There's no better way to leave your mark on the world than an epic entrance. Forget about first impressions or anything like that. The mere aura you radiate with such an appearance can put you on the same pedestal as that of a god, even if you're the bad guy. Please, God. This. God. To prove my point even further, I've decided to treat you to the top 25 legendary villain entrances in the movies. been tasked with spearheading the evil quota of what would go on to fuel the most commercially successful franchise of all time, then you need to bring your A-game to the table. That's exactly what Loki did when he invaded S.H.I.E.L.D. and stole the Tesseract from them, all while smiling and posing for the camera. Heck, he even stole two of their most crucial members, including a freaking Avenger. Loki's nonchalance is what sells the scene, and even though he never really caught on to the audience as a villain, this still remains the highlight of his career while on the dark side. It was the perfect way to set up the rest of the plot, and it got the audience interested right from the start. Mind you, given that the MCU was still relatively new at the time, watching Loki in action was a new experience for most viewers. You can see his wit, his dominance and his powers. Even Nick Fury was all but clueless against the God of Mischief, and that's saying something. <laughs> I do wonder what Jules Winfield would describe him as if he was ever given a hit on the leader of S.H.I.E.L.D. He's black! Go on! He's bald! Does he look like a bitch? What? <laughs> Does he look like a bitch? No! Then why you try to f him like a bitch, Brett? He didn't. Yes, you did. Why do you want to get in the Mandingo business? Ah. You don't intend to allow your second to make the proper introductions? Answer the question. This seems like a good bit of fun. Matt, you gotta give it to Quentin Tarantino for being able to surprise everyone with Leonardo DiCaprio showing up out of nowhere to become the main villain of Django Unchained. Now, when I saw this one in the theaters, no one knew that Leo was in the movie. So when he turned around and had the camera zoom into him like that so suddenly, the whole hall went crazy. It was awesome to watch and he totally nailed his role as Calvin Candy. The main characters were outstanding in this flick, but you've gotta admit that Leo stole every scene that he was in. <laughs> Finish. Go on, go on, finish. It was so impressive to watch him morph into this role so comfortably and command attention like his character demanded. I mean, you could even say that he was born to play a racist slave owner. But yeah, the build up to his eventual reveal was a stroke of genius from Tarantino. And to include this with the Mandingo fight just elevated Calvin to a whole other level of evil. Also, don't forget that this character has been cemented as one of the OG legends of meme history. Ain't never seen a nigga like you ever in his life. What is the point of having a nigga that speaks German? Well, be careful now, Dr. Schultz. You might have caught yourself a little dose of nigga love. Mm. Nigga love's a powerful emotion, boy. Mm. It's like a pool of black tar. Once it <laughs> catches your ass, you call exceptional nigga. Imagine being such a badass that you're greeted by a concert's worth of an audience when you just decide to show up. Shredder is an ominous and dangerous villain from the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise, and this entrance proves exactly why he's feared by many. All the people in his presence are effectively bowing down in subjugation to the underground tyrant, and he knows it. So he doesn't really need to command anything from his subjects. Even the way his outfit is designed oozes authority, so there's no way anyone from that crowd was going to oppose him. The dark tone of this scene alone is much better than all of the remakes that came after it. You see, it establishes Shredder as the final boss of this story, and you don't even need to see him fight to realize that the Turtles are gonna need a lot more than pizza to beat him. Also, let's not forget his speech on how the outside world has rejected everyone in front of him. The delivery is flawless, but I'd even go to say that this is the only other dude who could successfully pull off the I am your father line while looking like an evil samurai. You are here because the outside world rejects you. This is your family. I am your father. Mm. 
Rest in peace, Alan Rickman. You gave us one of the best characters of Harry Potter, and in this case, you also gave us the best die-hard villain. Hans Gruber elevated this film to a whole other level right from when he made his first appearance. Taking over the building in such slick fashion was one of the most badass ways to introduce yourself as the villain. And the way Gruber walks with that sass, you don't need to ask twice as to who the leader is of the gang. You've got to love the brief moment where Gruber secures the door from the inside. Michael Kamen's music takes an interval, throwing greater emphasis on Rickman's facial expressions as he scans the horizon and works his plan in his head. It solidifies how alert Gruber is to all the situations in front of him. He truly is one of the greatest villains of all time, and that's not an exaggeration in any way at all. The overall presentation of this scene also places great emphasis on Hans, so kudos to the cinematography team for pulling it off with such success. The only thing left was probably seeing Hans pull out his wand and chant the deadly Sectum Sempra spell. Ladies and gentlemen, Due to the Nakatomi Corporation's legacy of greed around the globe, they're about to be taught a lesson in the real use of power. You will be witnesses. Nice suit. John Phillips, London. I have two myself. Rome greets her new emperor. Your loyal subjects bid you welcome, Highness. Thank you, Falco. And for the loyal subjects. Trust they weren't too expensive. Joaquin Phoenix sure loves his European emperors, doesn't he? Here he is playing the Roman Commodus, and it would take him another 23 years to play the French Napoleon as well. My focus, though, is on Commodus' entrance in The Gladiator, because it's an epic moment from an epic film. First of all, there may not be any other scene which has ever given such an awesome impression of the Roman Empire at its height. A super state stretching from Scotland to the Persian Gulf, from the Rhine and Danube to the Atlas Mountains. It truly was a grand presentation, and Ridley Scott Scott knew what he was doing here. It's this presentation that makes the Commodus entrance look so epic. If I didn't know any better, I'd actually think he was the hero of the movie. Plus, even the costume he's wearing looks pretty cool and suitable for an emperor. Now, I know these scenes are being mentioned because of how they elevate the villain, but I just have to mention the line. He enters Rome like a conquering hero. What does he conquer? Now that's some brilliant screenwriting right there. Am I not merciful? Are you a man who once said death smiles at us all? All a man can do is smile back. Smile for me now, brother. <laughs> the filthy metal thieves will stole it from us. Curse them. We hate them. It's hard it is. And we want it. Now look, Gollum might not be a simple villain, but he does have a lot of evil traits, so he does technically classify as one. In this scene, he's definitely the bad guy as he tries to nab the ring from Frodo and Sam. His entrance is made to look extremely creepy and unsettling, with him crawling down towards his targets, almost as if he's actually a spider lurking for his prey. Then of course, we have the fight between him and the two lads who manage to eventually get the better of him, but not before making sure the audience is treated to a genuine struggle. The expressions on Gollum's face solidify his obsession session with the ring and the dude stays true to that feeling for the entirety of the scene. I love when he starts shrieking like a baby when they capture him. After behaving so menacingly earlier, it perfectly frames Gollum as a dichotomous entity. Right now, it's an 80s classic. It's the Predator making an iconic entrance without even doing a full face reveal. After taking down the imposing Blaine, all he does is give Mac a little sparkle from his eyes. And that's all we need to realize that we're in for one heck of a second half. The creature's appearance was so impactful that it got a whole bunch of brawny dudes to unload almost all of their artillery on absolutely nothing. You could even call it a strategic move from the villain's end because this species is known for being tactical. Now, we all know that the Predator is strong 
strong enough to take on multiple muscle men at the same time, but in this scene, he basically toys around with them to see how they respond to a stressful situation. I mean, he was basically being more of a psychologist here than a foe, but I guess when you've got biceps that big, you need to flex them while taking down an entire section of a freaking forest. But yeah, this sequence sure got everyone hyped AF. <laughs> I started this company. You know how much I sacrificed? You're out, Norman. Am I? <laughs> out, am I? When you have the same skill set as William Defoe, it should come as no surprise that you can make anything look fun. Heck, the man even makes sitting look like a complex art. Now, his first appearance as the Green Goblin pretty much set the standard for the king of supervillains we need to expect from comic book movies. Right from the mystery and confusion surrounding what he was to the part where he literally starts blowing everything up in front of him, the energy levels were top class, and you can see that Norman Osborn is truly enjoying his new life as a villain. The real moment of truth comes when he deals with Spider-Man's punch though, to use the term impressive, while effortlessly blocking a superhero's attack is the most giga chad thing anyone can do. He really had Peter Parker running for dear life at one point, which immediately communicated his threat level to us. The fact that this man didn't play the Green Goblin for nearly 20 years, but jumped right back into the role with an even better performance than before was even more of a flex. But the one thing they love more than a hero is to see a hero fail, fall, die trying. In spite of everything you've done for them, eventually they will hate you. Why bother? <clears throat> I like these calm little moments before the storm. It reminds me of Beethoven. You're a special kind of villain if your presence is so spooky that it even creeps out your own men. Norman Stansfield is a truly iconic villain, although people don't really talk about him as often as they should. His true introduction to us in this scene showcases his persona as that of a murder-loving psychopath who's ready to do anything as long as it amuses him. Just look at how he goes around ending all these people without a single care in the world. That too with a shotgun. Bro so unhinged that he even appreciated a mutual interest in Beethoven before shooting down the same person playing his music. You know what's really funny about this though? Gary Oldman actually played Beethoven in Immortal Beloved, which coincidentally released the same year as Lee on The Professional. Man, that stare when he consumes the drug is just phenomenal acting. Mesmerizing to say the least from Gary Oldman, who at this point pretty much convinced me that he has multiple personalities of his own. Bring me everyone. What do you mean everyone? If a time machine was ever invented, I want to go back to 1960 to watch the audience reaction to seeing this scene for the first time in the theatres. Psycho is on every critic's list of best horror movies and the shower scene alone is enough to vouch for that claim. I mean, the protagonist dies halfway through the movie and the second half is completely carried by the antagonist. It was super revolutionary at the time to have such a structure. Now, I know we don't get to see the face of the villain here, but you don't need to. It's the horror of this act that captivates us as the audience. It's built up perfectly, so we're expecting something, but to simply see a female figure stabbing at Marion totally led us the wrong way and further proves why Alfred Hitchcock was a cinematic genius. This sequence remains one of the best horror moments of all time, and the villain's semi-reveal is still used today as a reference point whenever you want to surprise your viewers with your antagonist. All things considered though, I'd say that that's the cleanest motel bathroom I've ever seen. Maybe they were a lot better with hygiene in the 60s.
We've got back-to-back -back classics now as Psycho shower scene is followed by the chest burster scene from Alien. The shock value from this sequence alone was more than that of all the following Alien films combined. There's just no way you can top something of this level, even if you try to get the same director to try it. You know, I would have actually placed this entrance a lot higher, but the thing is that the xenomorph is so tiny here, it almost looks cute, even though it's literally just ripped itself out of a human's chest. Not only was this scene unsettling, it also gave us perspective on what the eventual alien looks like when it's born. The xenomorph that terrorizes the crew later on is definitely a unit, but nothing will ever beat the first ever chest burster scene in cinema history. Once again, let me remind you that there was no CGI used in this sequence, which is why it feels so raw and realistic. Imagine making such an impact in your first entrance that you become associated with nightmares for the rest of human existence. A Nightmare on Elm Street will forever remain one of the best horror movies of all time and Freddy Krueger has already been crowned a horror icon. This scene where he meets Tina is the perfect way to introduce him as the villain and while I'll admit that the scene doesn't feel scary to a modern movie watcher, it doesn't take away from the fact that the overall build up was perfect for Freddy. This is the real Fred Krueger too, a demented shady serial killer who found a loophole into immortality, not the sunglasses wearing supervillain he became in the sequels. Anyway, his claw glove and elongated arms up the creep factor and calling himself God while showing Tina his burnt face was freaking diabolical. Also, I know that Tina must have been very confused and scared here, but when a horror icon is chasing after you and tells you to watch something, I probably wouldn't recommend standing there and actually watching it. it, run from it, destiny arrives all the same, and now it's here. Yep, this scene may not be as old as most of the others, but that doesn't mean it doesn't deserve top billing. The introduction of Thanos as this absolute beast of a fighter was the best possible way to get the audience acquainted with him. We see him as this ridiculously overpowered supervillain who not only dominates the Asgardian brothers, but also beats the freaking Hulk to a pulp. Thor being treated like a side piece the entire time only further highlighted Thanos as the final boss of the MCU. There's also the fact that Josh Brolin delivers his lines with so much depth that you almost felt like joining Thanos in his mission to eradicate half of the universe's population. Bro ended the main villain of the first Avengers movie, took the MacGuffin of the exact same film and defeated the two strongest Avengers all within five business minutes. No resurrections this time. Are you sure this is about him? It's about her. You see, we are the last two rats. We can either eat each other or eat everyone else. Well, first time for everything. Javier Bardem is one of those actors who, as soon as he enters the frame, just says, this is a nice place you've got here, it's all mine now. His portrayal of Silver was spot on, and it really helped the character become the most memorable Bond villain in recent history. I mean, out of all the 007 villains, Silver's the most significant antagonist that comes to mind. He nailed this role primarily due to his history and motivations. A heartbroken, vengeful, former agent filled with anger. It's the most personal purpose out of anyone. And to top it off, the way he enters the scene and tells James Bond on the rat story, I mean, it kind of freaks you out. And they begin to get hungry. And one by one, they start eating each other until there are only two left, the two survivors. At the same time, though, it tells you everything you need to know about Silver. Well, apart from the fact that he likes to flirt with his captives. That dude's henchmen must have definitely had a lot to talk about during their lunch breaks. Do you know what it does to you? Hydrogen cyanide? Look upon your work, Mala. Mm -hmm. 
Robert De Niro has this thing where he can look extremely dangerous yet alluring at the same time. Seeing Max Cady for the first time immediately communicates to us that we're seeing a bad man. The aura around this character is so mysterious and still so evil that you feel uncomfortable even while watching him do some extremely clean dips. At least Bro took his fitness seriously, am I right? Also, notice how no other prisoner even bothers to taunt or tease Max as he makes his way outside to freedom. It subconsciously tells us that he's a man who's respected out of fear and he wants it to be that way. I also like the contrast between Katie's release from prison and the black stormy cloud on the back. It's essentially a metaphor telling us something bad is coming to town and as we move further into the movie we realize that it also doubled up as a touch of foreshadowing. Yeah, Martin Scorsese, this is cinema. Excuse me. Excuse me. Ah! Ah! Harry Potter, we meet again. It's top 10 time, so we're going to start big with the greatest wizarding franchise of all time. Lord Voldemort, aka he who must not be named, is a super iconic villain who's had his presence right throughout the entire Harry Potter series. But when it comes to his first impressions, he sure had all of us screaming with fear. This is the first time we see Voldemort, and it's in the form of a second face on Quirrell's head. It's so creepy to watch, and yet the reveal is executed so smoothly that you can't help but appreciate the massive payoff. Also, so don't forget that Harry is only a kid here, so seeing such a sight would have definitely left him with a lot of trauma. Either way, this kicked off a universe that would go on to create a legacy for everyone who was lucky enough to be alive at the time of this film's release. Hello! A lot of horror movies have found their way into this list, and for good reason too. Their villains run the whole show, and with so many iconic films in the genre, it shouldn't come as a surprise. Leatherface is um, the face of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and his first appearance nabs him a victim in the form of Kirk. This is probably one of the most realistic and impactful kills I've ever seen in a movie. Everything about it is brutal. The suddenness, the way Leatherface smashes Kirk's head, the convulsions of his victim, and the doors closing. It really is raw AF. Imagine the theatre stunned silence upon first seeing the iconic villain. There's no building music, no jump scare stinger. Bro just pops into the frame and tenderizes the guy's skull. Yeah, Tobe Hooper sure knew what he was doing when he made this film and designed his characters. <laughs> Stanley Kubrick was known for making masterpiece after masterpiece, and A Clockwork Orange is no different. The idea of having a villainous character as your protagonist may have been tried a few times before, but no one was able to pull it off as well as Alex Delage. His introduction is basically the film's intro as well, and it's widely considered to be one of the best opening sequences of all time. I mean, to just start off with Alex's face staring into our souls with that menacing look would give anyone the creeps, and then you've got the camera panning out to reveal all of the other debauchery that he's surrounding himself with. It's an epic shot that's been mimicked and copied by several other directors, and to this day, I still get the chills whenever I watch this opening sequence. We just don't know what to expect from Alex in this first meeting with him, but if his demeanor's anything to go by, I'd say he's getting us ready for a bit of the old ultra-violence. This movie seriously challenged the notions of morality, which caused a lot of controversy, but now that we're in the 2020s, it's safe to say that this entry is nothing short of legendary. Oh yeah, I may have mentioned this in some previous entries, but you should know that Alex was one of the prime inspirations for Heath Ledger's Joker. Give them to me, now. You
Arnold Schwarzenegger found himself first on this list with Predator, and now he's here as the freaking Terminator. It just goes to show how familiar he is with classic films, but having said that, I think it's fair to say Arnie reached a peak in his career playing the T-800. He'd eventually go on to become a hero, but let's not forget that the very first film actually had him playing the main antagonist right until he got his circuit smashed. Of course, his entrance was also top class, especially for the ladies who could enjoy all those muscles just being flashed out there for no apparent reason. Also, let's not forget the bro taught a bunch of punks a very serious lesson when it comes to picking on buff dudes with no clothes on. I love you too, sweetheart. Get out. I'll be back. A census taker once tried to test me. I ate his liver with some fava beans and a nice Chianti. Oh yes, this one's an absolute gem of an introduction to an S-tier villain. The Silence of the Lambs redefined horror movies as a whole after films like Psycho and The Shining laid the groundwork for it. Of course, none of that would have mattered had it not been for the man himself, Hannibal freaking Lecter. His very first scene happens to be with Clarice and everything about it keeps you hooked. The director could have shown the villain however he liked to make it dramatic, but he chose a simpler style which kept the audience grounded during the first impression. Of course, everything changed as Anthony Hopkins got into the zone and what followed was one of the best interactions we've seen in a film. Tell me, Senator, did you breastfeed her? Now, wait a minute. Yes, I did. Toughened your nipples, didn't it? Oh, son of a... Oh, and Senator, just one more thing. Love your suit. Look at you. What do you believe in, huh? What do you believe in? I believe... Whatever doesn't kill you simply makes you a stranger. I did just mention his inspiration a few entries ago, so I suppose it's mandatory to include the Joker as well. I mean, he would have made it to this list regardless, because it would be silly not to have him after he pulled off such an elaborate heist. Heath Ledger was hiding in plain sight as we see the various clowns rob the bank, but it was only after the Joker revealed himself with that quirky line did we realise that we were in for a treat. The movie and the character both went from strength to strength that moment forward, and I can't imagine a single villain who's been able to leave the same kind of impact after The Dark Knight. Sure, there's Joaquin Phoenix's rendition of the character as well, but you just can't be a legend like Heath. I'm gonna make this pencil disappear. <laughs> it's... it's gone. It's simple. We uh, kill the Batman. <laughs> if it's so simple, why haven't you done it already? If you're good at something, never do it for free. <laughs> yes, sir. I got it under control. <laughs> People don't talk about him as often as other villains, but Anton Chigger is an absolute force of nature and certified freak. That isn't an exaggeration either. Even science agrees that the man is as realistic as a psychopath can get. Javier Bardem sure seems to have a knack for playing such characters, doesn't he? But Anton is definitely worth the praise. To introduce him by having him choke a man to death without any remorse on his face was perfect character building. Also, the part where he calmly shoots down another man and takes his car was chilling to say the least. It hasn't even been five minutes since you've met the character and you already want to be away from him here you go what? you gonna clamp him buddy can you get those chicken grates out of the bed what are you talking about detective you're looking for me look away from him on the floor i know you now I'd like to speak to my lawyer, please. God damn it! This one will never not send chills down my spine. John Doe is such an appropriate name for a killer who's been kept hidden from us for around two thirds of a whole movie. His reveal is so well constructed that we all know this dude is the murderer. So ugly on the inside that she couldn't bear to go on living if she couldn't be beautiful on the outside. A, a drug dealer, a, a drug dealing pederast actually. And let's not forget the disease spreading whole. 
but the detectives only pay him heed after he shouts out DETECTIVE in front of everyone. The energy is tense and you can sense that something's up, but not in the way that John has prepared for us. Kevin Spacey may be a controversial man in real life, but I'd be lying if I said he isn't a phenomenal actor. Only in a world this shitty could you even try to say these were innocent people and keep a straight face. We see a deadly sin on every street corner, in every home, and we tolerate it. We tolerate it because it's common. It's, it's trivial. Well, not anymore. And that reward will be your family will cease to be harassed in any way by the German military during the rest of our occupation of your country. You're sheltering enemies of the state, are you not? Yes. You can hate Quentin Tarantino all you want, but there's no way you can tell me that the opening to Inglorious Bastards wasn't impressive. Hans Lander gave us a once in a lifetime performance here with an initially charming demeanor that slowly devolves into an evil, almost demonic aura. The shift in his facial expression when he goes, you're harboring enemies of the state, are you not? Is just so good. This man was supposed to be a side character at first, but he went on to become the main star of the show with his depiction. Christoph Waltz seriously turns up the dial when it comes to his performance here, and the reason it's so chilling is because there was probably a man who was exactly like him during the war. This movie changed the culture and it was spearheaded by Darth Vader, who changed the way we looked at villains altogether. The man built his own personal cult of fans with his first appearance and he made sure to make it count. He doesn't even need to say a word because his presence is all that's required to make everyone in the room know the boss is here. Darth Vader's legendary entrance here isn't just about a supervillain making a name for himself, it's also about establishing a legacy that carries on right until the folks at the production houses decided to ruin it with those sequel films and whatever the heck came after that. I'm a member of the Imperial Senate on a diplomatic mission to Alderaan. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away! Hope you like this video. Please subscribe to the TV Regent, and here's another video that I know you're going to enjoy. Exceptional, nigga. Everyone!